or me. <clears throat> My guest tonight brings words together like an ampersand. He is an East Coast Canadian legend, represent representing Backburner. Please give a warm East Coast coverage welcome to the one and the only Word Burgala. Yo, MDB. Yo, what's up, man? Thank you for having me. That uh, that intro is uh, is unwarranted, but oh, uh, no, I appreciate I, it, my friend. Man, I undersold that one for sure. You uh, you're an East Coast legend for real, for real. Um, man, and we got to get deep into the roots of, um, uh, how you started this whole thing. Um, tell me about young Sean. Oh, uh, isn't that a rapper? I feel like there's a rapper named young Sean. <laughs> oh, I guarantee there is. Young everyone. <laughs> young everybody. Young. Yeah. Well, I always say that I'm no years old, so I guess I can be young Bergie. Um, oh, yeah. Yo, uh, well, you know, I grew up in Halifax. Mm -hmm. uh, I love music of all kinds. Probably mm -hmm. discovered rap. I don't know. Like, I was trying to figure this out. Maybe like grade two or grade three. Um, I used to go, there's a YWCA around the corner for me growing up, which yep. has now been turned into a condo. Like, you know, surprise right down on Barrington Street there. Yeah. But it used to be a Y. And my dad knew a guy who ran a record store and they would have these record shows at the Y. And I remember going there and you could get records for like 25 cents. Oh, wow. And I would just get records that, you know, appealed to me being a kid. And I remember getting, well, I got a weird Al Yankovic record, surprise, mm -hmm. surprise, because that's what you listen to when you're a kid. And now I love Weird Al, no. Of course. Of course. But um, I got like a Fat Boys record. Yep. I remember that. And uh, and then, you know, around that time, I was just discovering like Fresh Prince and Run DMC and like some older kids in my neighborhood. And my cousins were like getting me hip to like, uh, you name it, LL Cool J, Public Enemy, like anything, like basically like that late 80s, you know, rap explosion that was happening. I was just yeah. kind of like super young and just like, whoa, and just like getting my ears on anything that I could, uh, I could find. And then, um, yeah, a couple years later, I got a paper route and got some more money and the route and the route. And then I spent my money on uh, a rap rap tapes and cds because yeah. you know back then you could choose it's like well do i buy one cd or do i buy two tapes oh, <laughs> see, is the case, man. and uh so two tapes was the deal yeah. and um i just always loved rap and i was just kind of always messing around with it and rapping with my friends and mm -hmm. uh you know i never really took it seriously i just like loved doing it and uh i never stopped loving it and i never stopped doing it and um you know, a million, million years yeah. later, I'm I'm here, you know, working on my next album. So there you go. Just to let you know, I'm going to swear more in this interview during uh, than you have your whole career. <laughs> well, I think maybe like pre pre 2012, I, I think I, I swore more, but uh, I kind of stopped swearing. Like, honestly, it became more of a challenge mm -hmm. not to. And I think that was maybe what more appealed to me about that it wasn't and also like making radio edits the more you got aware of oh if we send this out and then the dj's coming back me like yo i'm yeah. in iowa and i can't play this record so right. get me an edit and Absolutely. then it was like oh cool so then i got the idea I was like what if i try not to swear and uh that's some real i'm seeing right there um just like the science of wordplay and like no i don't need to use a swear here that's a crutch I can do something better here. Yeah, it's just more challenging, right? Like that's mm -hmm. like, and that just comes with, you know, the more you do it, you're, you know, I feel like with every track I make, I'm just yeah. always trying to challenge myself. I always want to kick rhymes that I've never heard rhymed before. I want to hear words I've never heard in a song. I want to hear concepts mm -hmm. I've never heard. I want to, I listen to rap all day, every day since I was a kid. And so mm -hmm. I'm always like, you know, I'm like, I'm always hyped when I hear something. I'm like, yo, I've never heard somebody rhyme that. Or I've never heard somebody like rap this concept before or do this style before. And right. uh, I definitely lean on stuff like that. I love, you know, definitely like that boom bap, like that Bronx hip hop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's kind of like where my heart goes back to, but, um, yes. but yeah, 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 man. No, it's all about tell. constantly pushing. Yeah. You could tell uh, from your early rap name, SJ Jazzy Jordan. 
<laughs> that sounded like some Bronx shit if I ever heard it. <laughs> that was probably more a ripoff of DJ Jazzy Jeff than yeah, anybody for else. Sure, for but sure. those are my initials, SJ, and it just kind of mm. like worked. And SJ Jazzy Jordan, and it was just like, let's do it. And uh, yeah, yeah, I rocked that name for maybe, uh, you know, all of grade five and six. And then I think I dropped the Jazzy Jordan around grade seven. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, was like your early, early days uh, in dregs of society or solo? Yeah, well, the dregs, you know, we were just kids. We were just messing around. We were just friends. And we had a crew. We just, we would all like listen to rap and like kick freestyles together and like spend all day just like thinking about rap and talking about hip hop. And, and just, you know, we became this crew and, you know, it does feel like a long time ago, but there was a time where, you know, especially maybe growing up in Nova Scotia, like being into hip hop, mm. you were definitely, you know, everybody was not into rap. That's right. for sure. So the kids who were like into hip hop, like, you know, we were hanging out with, you know, kids who were skating and like the punks and stuff like that. Yes. And, you know, there wasn't like, we were all bumping Wu-Tang Clan, but like, it was just us who knew who Wu-Tang Clan were kind of, you know what I mean? Mm. Now this is back, yeah. like we're talking like nineties, right? Like early nineties was, this is like before even like Wu-Tang forever. By the time mm. Wu-Tang forever came out, everybody knew Wu-Tang. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just like, um, we were just a crew. We were just a group of friends and we're, I'm still like best friends with these guys to this day and girls yeah. and the whole squad. Um, you still shout them out on records. Yeah. The dregs, that's my family. And like, uh, and they support me. And to be honest, they were the ones who always pushed me to rap more because yeah. I just always wanted to do it. Like I remember my buddy got like a PlayStation game where you could record beats. Like this was like, mm -hmm. we didn't have like computers, like, you know, again, I'm sounding like old, but like back then, like if you knew somebody with a CD burner, that yeah. was like, that was the craziest thing ever, right? And it's, people were it's, making super money off like burning CDs for people at school in my school for sure. Oh hell yeah! If you had a CD burner, you were a label. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, like I had like a cheap uh, double cassette deck dubbing tapes, and mm -hmm. uh, but the CD burner was like, whoa, like I mm -hmm. don't know, like you must know six two from the yes. Sebi Tones and and you know Hip Club Groove and everything. And 6'2", I remember he was one of the first local artists I knew to put out like an underground CD. Mm -hmm. And the rumor was that he had to go to like Truro because some somebody he knew was at a school in Truro. And I'm probably you'd have to ask him the story because I don't know it exactly. But I remember like you they'd go to Truro for the weekend and they burn like 50 CDs of their album. And it would take like a weekend to burn 50 CDs. Because yeah. things took like hours to make. And uh -huh. this is for people who don't remember CDs and CD burning. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and I remember buying, I've still got like the Sebitone CD that he sold me that I remember he'd gone to burn it in Truro and it was a big deal. So anyways, mm. that's some that's a bit of Nova Scotia yeah. hip hop uh, history for you. All right, we're going to get to the quotes early. On Word Burgala, you said, been been annoying rappers since junior high. Don't ask me. Ask J.O. Smooth and Buck 6-5. <laughs> That's true. It's all true, man. If it rhymes, it's real. That's uh, I was rhymes, annoying rappers real. in junior high. Because Buck 65, who you all must know, if you know uh -huh. East Coast or Canadian hip-hop, uh, the legend, and uh, you know, I love Buck 65, and it, honestly, like, I got to shout out all these people as I'm talking to them, because like, I don't think Buck 65 gets the props he deserves at, in terms of being a pioneer in the Canadian hip hop industry and in really, you know, the hip hop industry, like community at large, like what Rich did um, was really like phenomenal. And certainly like as a kid in Halifax growing up and like listening to him and everybody else who was doing stuff, you know, Joe Run, like Joe Run and Buck 65 mm. were like my gods. And, yes. uh, you know, and uh, I'm happy, like I'm working with them now, like they're both working on my new album. So, which wow. is very exciting. Um, but uh, so Buck 65 used to host a radio show called The Basement mm -hmm. and being in junior high, me and the dregs, we used to call in and we were annoying them. 
because we would call up every week and we just shout out all our friends and then we and then they would like start to make fun of us on the show but we were just kids and we're like yo this is the dopest thing ever we're getting shouted out on the radio so then everybody at like our junior high would be like tuning in and and then on the plus side I think we exposed a lot of kids at our junior high to dope underground hip hop, you know, because yeah. they would tune into this radio show. And we'd be like, yo, tune in Tuesday night at 9 p.m. The dregs are going to be on. And they'd never play our shitty tapes. <laughs> but, oh, they, man. Yeah. but they would shout us out. And J.O. Smooth, to complete this, uh, this story, and the reason I shout them out in the rhyme, but J.O. Smooth was the, other, was the host of the show with Buck 65. And mm-hmm. Buck 65 went by DJ Critical back then. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so they were on the show together. So that's, and that rhyme I probably wrote when I was like 17 or 18. Like, so that's taking me way back. So when you're mm-hmm. that, you know, you're rapping about your junior high days then, you know. Of course, you got I mean, to, I still am. To... I still, you know, you know, I, I dress like I'm 17 and think i'm 23 i don't know i gotta rhyme about that anyways hey man if it rhymes, sorry it's mdb real. yeah we're if it rhymes it's real my friend yeah was stewart your first rap song <laughs> no no but stewart was uh a song we did w- about our friend stewart who was grounded and couldn't come out and hang out that night so we just decided to rap a song about him and we all wrote verses about our buddy Stu, and <laughs> laid it down and there's like some hard rips in there too and it's just like but we love him he's our homie we're like yo you're just stuck at home and i remember calling him he's like i can't come home we're like, i can't come out what are you doing well i'm just watching star trek six on tv <laughs> so that got put in the yeah. song you know you lock yourself down and watch star trek star trek six you went out last night and got your fix um i don't mm. know but just yeah i think my first song was just with my friend craig and it was about a pterodactyl because we were just rapping on an old tape deck in like a classroom in like grade five or six or uh, lunchtime. I remember there being like a tape deck that you could record on. And we just like would, we played, I think it was a father MC song in the background. It was like, and that's an old, that's a dated reference. And father MC, we had like a tape because like Craig's brother was a DJ and had all this, you know, old great hip hop stuff. And, yep. um, and we just put that song on in the background on another tape player and recorded on this other tape player. And we just like made up rhymes that were terrible. And I remember we just called it the, the pterodactyl rap because there was like a pterodactyl on the wall of this classroom we were in doing it. So technically, if you want the first word burglar track, that would have been pterodactyl rap. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and i'm sure i probably rhymed like twice in the whole song <laughs> it's probably horrible um you're a comic book legend as well so we got to get into that even though i'm not like super comic book uh smart or whatever but you uh you started working at strange adventures yeah i did i worked at strange adventures a comic shop in halifax uh still there um mm. and yeah uh, i used to go there again i'd spend my money from my paper route on music i'd go to sam the record man mm. um or hmv and then i'd go to uh strange adventures and get comic books and then the owner cal who's you know to this day one of my best friends now mm. uh and family um yeah he he hired me and just he was like hey you know you want to work here and he hired me to just, just start working like one day a week and and in high school and then i just worked there for years and it was dope because I got to meet a lot of people in the music industry and like the Nova Scotia scene and like in the film industry and all this stuff. Cause all these artists would always come into the comic shop. Right. Mm. And it became this great community space, you know, art attracts more art. So, you know, if you're working in one discipline, you're going to meet people, you know, it's only natural. You're going to meet different artists. So I got to meet a lot of incredible people. I was just telling somebody the other day, I met like Joel Plaskett working at the comic shop, wow. and, like, you know, the bucks, you know, buck 65 and six, two used to come in. Joe run used to come in and, um, wow. 
And like Joe Rum back then was doing these all ages hip hop shows called Howtown Meltdown. Mm -hmm. um, and you could go there and you could see people, you know, class used to play there and um, well, Hip Club Groove and Universal Soul and just Nate, the Nathan, the alien, who's now um, uh, doesn't go by that name anymore. And uh, he's Quan. He goes by Quan now. And uh, okay. so many dope. MCs and DJs used to go through there and it was all ages hip hop shows in Halifax mm. and Joe run used to put those on and I would go. Yeah, I was probably like 13 when I went to the first one and they were, it was just dope just seeing all these local people there. So anyways, that, yeah, man, you're making you me think of all the, these memories. Is that man. how you got on the basement of bad men? Mm. No, so Basement is a Bad Man. Yeah, the first one came out and that like, again, I was just a paper boy uh, mm -hmm. buying my CDs and I went to Sam the Record Man, this Basement is a Bad Man CD was there and that was one of the first time that I'd seen all these amazing local hip hop uh, artists and you know, Tachichi was on there like so mm -hmm. many dope people, the goods, DJ Gordski, man, mm -hmm. like I could just shout out people all day. Um, and they're all on the CD Basement's a Bad Man. And I, I bought it and I was like, I don't know what this is, but I know these names on the back. I got to get this. And then it wasn't until like years and years later that uh, Han Solo Records, that label put out Basements of Bad Men 2. And oh, when wow. I heard about that, um, I was like, yo, they're doing a sequel. Like, I got to try and get on this. And that's when like that song that you quoted where I was like annoying rapper since junior high. That was one of that was basically like a demo song, and I submitted that with like four other tracks, and um, and yeah, Han Solo Records picked that one song, which was just called "The Word Burglar," and mm. it was basically like this, like you know, over the top, you know, crazy, fun jam, um, which I yeah. recorded in a room with people all around me. Like it wasn't like a booth. I recorded that for the first time, and it was like in this basement of this guy's place who had it was like this dude knew a rock band and they had like a setup in their basement. And I just got in, it was like a Friday night, people were like partying and drinking, and they're like, Yo, SJ is gonna like record on this, come on over. So I went up and I just recorded this. And Beat Mason had given me these beats, and I had like just been talking with Beat Mason about this. And you know, shout out Beat Mason, you know, a hundred percent shout out um, Beat Mason. And th that was like, really, those were the first songs I did with him. And we recorded that on a tape and uh, yeah, I just, I just rapped. And I remember re kicking the chorus and it wasn't even like, I didn't even know it was going to be a chorus. This is how, like, I didn't know anything about songwriting when I was just like on the word burglar, a burglar words. And like everybody there was like hype and like just laughing and just feeling it and like vibing out. And so in that original version, like I'm actually performing for a bunch of people hanging in this basement, drinking and who knows, doing who knows what. And, uh, and that was that first track. And then yeah. that tape got dubbed a whole bunch of times. And I was SJ then I was like SJ and the word burglar. And then, you know, people just didn't remember sj they just remembered word burglar so i was like well all right that mm -hmm. name works for me like sounds mm -hmm. like a you know it sounds like a 90s rap name it sounds like a superhero it like describes what i do you know because right. my rhymes are hot and you burgle words i burgle words so it just it, it just kind of came together like that 100 percent. and i could totally tell there was something different going on in the studio uh, for that song because your presentation was like mean you were like <laughs> hard as fuck you know <laughs> well you again too, in your voice man yeah man yeah well that was like also you gotta remember that era was like you gotta like and obviously today too anytime right but like you know especially being a kid like you're trying to figure out who you are figure out what your style is and yeah. on that demo i had five different tracks that were all different right that was like the hype kind of mean like in your face which i still like do that vibe you know i still tap into that style and then there was like the more chill there was a track called no flow which was just like chilling and super laid back and quiet yeah. and then there was like one that i call is like super scientifical you know like that style where it's just like crazy rhymes and like 
just going on and kicking like 64 bars or something of just like you know like cannabis like what am i you know just like i gotta rap i got all these rhymes i just gotta say them (laughs) yeah no 100 percent. so those are just all like the early flavors of me just like testing the waters and seeing what what voices what my voice was and like yeah it's a very young mc like experimenting with different styles and even on that song there's like some rhymes written on there where i'm like oh yo that rhyme is actually pretty good you know i would take it differently today but (laughs) of course (laughs) if i do say so myself your 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 blueprint is laid out now so everything would be different you know if you uh redid that demo i mean everything would be different about it yeah um quote straight out of halifax dabbled in battle raps who are you battling oh man so this again, what song is that from? Scova Notions. So that's like, that came out on Burglaritis. Mm. And that's like before there wasn't King of the Dot. There wasn't like battle, like, you know, that Ellen's was like. League was probably there, but like. No, nah, I, I mean, look, team? shout out those guys, but I don't even think they were there then. Like, okay. I mean, they might've been, I didn't know them. I was just battling mm. like in my high school cafeteria at St. Pat's high, I was battling like, you know, at parties. And back then it also wasn't even like that battle, like battling changed a lot after eight mile came out, you know, like that, I think there's a lot of reasons and factors that went into it, But, but back then it was more like, Oh, this guy raps, this guy raps, you guys battle. And it was just too, and it was like, you're at a party. There's a bunch of people around who's going to rhyme, who can rap the most. And I would, and you just run. And then like, I developed freestyle skills from doing that, but it was more like, you know, I get in people's faces, but um, Mm -hmm. you could tell, like, sometimes you'd go up against somebody and they clearly weren't a rapper, but like their friends thought they were the rapper. And then they would get like sore because they couldn't rap. Right. (laughs) And I'm some nerdy kid, just like dropping stupid rhymes and, um, but yeah, that was uh, that was it. That's where I dabbled in battle raps, just like all over. Hell yeah! Like, um, did you record a lot at Joe's, um, Joe Runs back in the day, or re- did you just record Butterfly off that album, um, Burglaritis? I believe. Yeah, I I didn't record at Joe Runs. Um, I recorded so Butterfly was recorded. I'm trying to remember. Beat Mason hooked up some studio space where was it like on Roby street somewhere mm. and i think it was like formerly rita mcneil's studio or something and oh, wow. I, like she was on the walls there i remember thinking it was like funny that i was there recording like some like obs- you know just underground rap track and like yeah. i'm staring at pictures of rita mcneil you know and like dudes are rolling joints and it's just like it although she'd probably be down with that you know rest in peace rita mcneil of course yeah of course but, rest um, in peace. but uh yeah no i never actually recorded with joe and uh but in that time we did butterfly and then cream of wheat so mm, man joe you're going way back wheat. you're jogging my memory i'm like that wow. was joe that was 15 years wheat. ago man 15 years ago yeah wow cream of wheat's probably my favorite song that you've ever done uh it's just one of those joints that i can just like kind of sing along with like uh without even thinking about it uh the chorus just like stays with me i'd be walking down the street singing cream of wheat you know what i mean it's just it's a beautiful song man well i'm glad Uh, thank you i appreciate that yeah shout out joe run on that beat man that's like yeah that's just a classic joe beat um it's a classic word burglar song you anticipate uh what it's like to be a nova scotia kid (laughs) thanks like for real like i grew up in amherst nova scotia so it's like two hours away from halifax but like you know, I could relate on so many levels. There was small differences. Like I wasn't watching Blue Nui. I was more a Red <laughs> Shoe Diary guy. <laughs> but, Yo, I love that. I never put together that they both were like softcore pornography that had a color in the title. Yeah, <laughs> totally, dude. Totally. Oh, MDV. Nice, man. Nice. Yes. Yes. 
Um, and just like eating cream of wheat, like, you know, it's not the greatest, but like, you know, my parents were like, oh, it's healthy, eat it, you know? And yeah, it was, it's healthy, it's easy. And, uh, you know, if you put it brown sugar on it, it's probably not that healthy, but you know, I love it with brown sugar to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Cream of wheat. Oh, you froze. Uh, too much gluten now, eh? Oh yeah, sorry. Your your feed froze, or maybe my feed froze. Can you uh, see me? Yeah, I can see you. Okay. Yeah, is this video? Talking. Is this like a video podcast, or is this a uh, audio? Podcast? No, it's video. It's video. Okay. But, um, you know, make sure I don't have any like spaghetti on me or something. All oh right. man, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. I'm busted up too, man. It's all good. Um, man. Okay. After that, you released Bergie's Basement in 2009. Yeah, I did. Yeah, it was a, uh, I had been working on Third Burglar and mm. Bergie's Basement. I had a bunch of tracks coming together. And as we know, you know, in underground rap, you know, things take time. Nobody's mm. got money. Nobody's got resources. It's like mm. constantly like, you know, my album would get pushed back. I couldn't get in the studio. I'm working day jobs. I'm all over the place. There's a million other things going on in my personal life. I was going through like a breakup at the time. There was just like, I was like couch surfing. There's basically all these crazy things going on in that period of time. And, but I had all these tracks that I've been recording and some remixes and I was about to go on tour. And mm. essentially I was like, all right, I guess I got enough tracks to throw together this like new album so that became Bergie's Basement and uh yeah I toured toured all over the place with that that summer and then I only made it on CD like I just did CDs I did like 500 CDs and they were pretty much gone by the end of the tour and then right. Herbnet was like yo we want to put this out so mm -hmm. Herbnet put it out digitally and um yeah it existed on digitally so i think that's it yeah i think we only made 500 cds i we might have done a second run maybe i did do a second run of them but i have none now but there's not that many cds out there maybe a thousand tops if you've wow. got one but I think, um, I think it's just 500. it's crazy you said that because like being being young and looking at much music videos and stuff you would think that your whole life changed after cream of wheat <laughs> Well, you know what? In some ways it did. Uh, I mean, definitely like Burglaritis, that was like, that's what I consider my first real album, right? Yeah. Every, before Burglaritis was all just other, like with Burglaritis, I came in and I was like, yo, this is like, first of all, I want to prove that I was more than just like the Burglar Words, Gurgling Turds guy. Cause like that song mm -hmm. like was great. And it like got me out there to a lot of people, but I was like, yo, I do other stuff. I do other styles. So with Burglaritis, it's like I think there's like 19 or 20 songs on there and it was just like yeah. yo I was like ready to go and I had a rhyme book that I've been building there's like rhymes on there that I was writing in like you know high school still wow. um anyway so that changed because getting that album out there but then it was like that dropped in 2006 and the music industry in that like things were just really starting to flip over digital was coming in but not everybody could get on digital it wasn't right. easy to get on itunes at the time distro was in like we had distro and burglaritis got wound up going you could find it in hmv or whatever the stores were and um but i didn't see like any money like it was just like it got out there i got paid in cds i sold mm -hmm. the cds I got to do shows yeah. and then I was just hustling to try and get videos. And it took like two years to get two videos made because we did cream of wheat and we did the root. And then we shot a video for the WB that never mm. came out and it just yeah. never got finished. And it was just like, not really, it just it was not that great. We needed more footage. Um, so yeah, cream of wheat got on much music yeah. and I didn't even understand like it was getting played on um there was a show called the wedge which was like this mm -hmm. underground indie music like of all genres yeah and they played cream of wheat and so people i think started to know me from cream of wheat just from that and it was like a different scene so i would start getting booked off booking you know i book shows from that um 
but it was tough. Like, you know, and I didn't know, like, I didn't have a manager. I didn't know how to like do anything. <laughs> um, and then I was just, I wound up, the good thing that happened from that was somehow people on the internet found me and mm -hmm. my space was a thing. Yeah. And I started, people started messaging me on my space and booking me for shows um, like in the U S. So I was going down to the U S and then, then I started meeting like a bunch of different American artists and, and, um, and that. So, yeah, I guess in a lot of ways, burglar right is, yeah, it definitely changed my life. I'm definitely proud of that record, but um, it more just made me hungrier to do more, but there yeah. is a huge gap. If you look at like burglar right is, was, 2006 Burgie's basement 2009 yeah and then third burglar was 2012 which really three years between albums isn't that bad i mean now people are dropping an album a month and it's like but it's yeah. all garbage <laughs> so yeah the like, only person that do, does that successfully right now is papoose he, i think he's doing an album a month and he's you know gotten some really good hits off of that but um Oh yeah, yeah, Papoose is dope. And yeah, you look at like Griselda and those guys, like there's like yeah. a new Griselda album every week. So yeah, obviously like it can do it. But back then I was like, I don't know, you know, I certainly didn't have like, you know, the means to like push it further. Um, mm -hmm. The videos were the best you could get. And then much music kind of died out. So by the time 2012 video came fact, around. Yeah. So Video Fact was amazing and huge and helped me and so many artists out. And mm -hmm. there's definitely like, even to this day, I'll, I was just talking with like um, uh, the Odario and Odario is like of that era, like with Mood Rough and stuff. Um, oh, wow. They were doing like the Video Facts things and Odario's killing it now and um, always. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't oh, know. Yeah. It was great. And I'm like, I'm proud of it. It's crazy because it was 15 years ago. So I'm just thinking of everything in between. Um, and I wish I knew then what I knew now, but, but I of didn't. Course. So I had to learn it and I had to work harder. So that's the journey, man. That's yeah, the man. journey. Yeah. Dude. Um, this is great, man. Like you're, you're really good at, at this. Yeah. How's this going for you? You having fun? Like, like just in general, blast, doing these man. Um, every just in general, like doing these interviews. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in in general, I get to talk to my heroes, and that's just so inspiring. And like, I get to put all of your history on on this digital format that'll never go away, and that means a lot to me. Yo, man, it means a lot to me, and I've still got your CD, man. Is it with what? like downtown Amherst and the lights and stuff? Right, yeah. that is downtown Amherst, I think. Yeah. Right? Um, actually, I might be downtown Moncton. Shout out to Nails, the Odd Fellow, uh, to that did the uh, graphics for that. Yes, Nails. I did a show with Nails. Like, yes, you did. In the before times, I did a few shows with Nails, but yeah. I definitely did one in Toronto with him. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's out there before now, the pandemic. Uh, in uh, London, I believe. Okay, dope. Yeah, London is a hotbed for Canadian rap. Uh, I might, I might be wrong with that, but he just got signed to breaking records, the, the label. So oh, dope. Uh, congratulations to nails since we're bringing him up. Yo, that's, that's, that's dope. Yeah. And shout yeah. out breaking records for sure. And uh, Alex yeah. is involved in this operation, isn't he? Yes. He, uh, he does some of the really, really big interviews. Like, um, you know, he's really into uh, the, the Buffalo movement that's going on. He's got a show called the, the Renaissance show. Dope. Um, so yeah um, yeah no alex knows his stuff so shout out to alex, alex for sure man and, i met uh, him years ago and when he was starting this like canadian hip-hop history uh, yeah book he's working on i think yeah. absolutely man yeah. um he's uh definitely inspirational like he's done interviews with joe run and people that i can only imagine doing interviews with you know what i mean and it's just like um it's so good to be on the same team Yo, definitely. And Joe Run, there you go. That's a pioneer of Canadian hip hop. Like Joe Run should be a household name. Like for uh -huh. my money, I'd rather listen to Joe Run than Drake all day. But you know, oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. No, you know, no shade. No, I don't want to diss Drake, but I'm just I mean, saying, like, you know, if the world, you know, I mean, uh, Joe Run on some of those early Ground Squad joints, and uh, you know, he was doing the whole Howltown movement, of course, but like. You know, I really got into them during the ground squad days. 
yeah um, and wolf first words um yeah just so many and like the funk box reload go check out the funk box reload uh because he's doing this dope mixtape and he's like like on i think it's on mix cloud if you look up funk box reload but uh yeah joe yeah, yeah. and listen joe gets mad props from people he doesn't need me to to do all this but like god no um, and like quest from, love and dj jazzy jeff and jazzy like Kim and like all these people you know like you got Rakim and DJ Jazzy Jeff and Quest Love, like showering you with love, and uh, mm. and he's just you know chilling in Halifax at a cafe, and people yeah. don't know it's fun. It started in Halifax. Yeah, man. that's incredible, incredible. Um, so you you put out Third Burglar in 2012, um, and that was dope as hell. You you finally got out Third Burglar. Uh, you, said you were working on that for a long time um welcome to cobra island is a cool concept album uh that you uh started making uh after leaving the theater uh after watching a not so cool gi joe movie <laughs> yeah man you heard that yeah, um, of course. we have yeah to look, look i mean i i always loved I love G.I. Joe. I read the G.I. Joe comics. And mm. again, if you were in that era growing up, like G.I. Joe was the bomb. And like, you know, kids after us got into like Power Rangers or whatever. And that's cool. I'm not dissing whatever. But G.I. Joe was like, there's just so many adventures and fun creativity that like I had with those toys as a kid. And I read mm. the comics and the comics were written by a Vietnam vet who had mm. actual incredible experiences to draw on. And he wrote about these stories in the comics, which were like, you know, I'm like an eight year old kid reading these comics and yeah. the G.I. Joe comics were like just incredible comics and they stand up to this day. Anyways, I would always tell people, I was like, no, G.I. Joe's dope. G.I. Joe's dope. They're like, oh, okay, whatever. That's stupid. And they're like, yo, why'd you rhyme about G.I. Joe? Why are you always like dropping G.I. Joe references? I'm like, yo, mm -hmm. some guys are always dropping X-Men references or referencing weed or referencing cigars or right. referencing, like, what's wrong with me referencing something I know about and I think is cool? <laughs> I mean, so yeah, absolutely. I kind of did it, you know, when that G.I. Joe movie came out and it sucked. I kind of felt like this personal... <laughs> <laughs> I just needed to like prove to people. I was like, yo, this thing that I've always liked, you know, you're not going to make fun of me because this movie sucked. Uh, right. I'm going to show you why I think this is dope. And mm -hmm. I basically approached it like all my favorite concept albums from, you know, Prince Paul, Prince of Thieves, Cool Keith, Dr. Octagon, mm -hmm. any number of, of records, Wu-Tang Clan. I mean, you know, there's just so many great so many like, when you just can create those visuals and the vibe. And, um, I was just, I, it was just going to be one song. And then as I started writing, it just grew into an album and, you know, shout out Timbuktu who I worked on the album with from Backburner and, you know, Swamp Thing, of course. Yeah. Uh, and Timmy, Timmy was really supportive. I was like, yo, this record's actually turning out really good. <laughs> And uh, he was like really encouraging. And so I was like, all right, we're doing it. We're, we're going to put out this G.I. Joe album. And uh, yeah, I just dropped it for free. It's still free. You can go to Bandcamp and download it. And my yeah. goal was to make it a dope album, whether you know anything about G.I. Joe or not. And I just basically borrowed the concepts of characters and everything and like used it to like tell stories within that universe over like beats that were just, you know, fire yeah <laughs> thanks um, man so yeah that's that was what Rad Viper Viper does it for me uh it, it's like um you explained it so awesome you said like if uh if if you know they had uh an mc that would rep their gang this would be the rap viper you know what i mean like um a, an mc to rep them that's exactly it man it was like yeah and I thought that was so cool because, you know, we always see um, all this gang culture in uh, hip hop and stuff, but like you related it to something near and dear to you. And uh, that was cool as hell. Thanks, man. Yeah. I'm uh, and Mr. E shout out Mr. E on the beat and like more or less mm. who did like cuts all over that album that are just he would bring in these cuts and it was like just better than I could have imagined. Like it was like he's sampling Biggie or Jizza or something. It's like, yo, yeah. you pull this in and like Mr. Lift and it works so perfectly. Mm. There's a Busta Rhyme sample on there that's just like fits 
immaculately. So, yeah. um, you know, shout out the DJ always. You need Absolutely. a DJ in your rap songs. Don't forget the DJ. Absolutely. Um, I feel like that slept on in today's music right now. You know, you don't really hear too many DJ MC combos. So, um, I mean, yeah. yeah, no, you know, there's still a lot of dope ones for sure. But yeah, it's definitely an art that I hope doesn't get left behind. I mean, the culture lives with us. So, you know, we're never going to let it. Exactly, so, man. Exactly. That's what's up with that. Um, replicable skills. <laughs> wow. Replicable skills. Replicable skills, man. Yeah. People said that title was like unpronounceable. And I was like, I'm putting out this album. That's what I'm calling it. So yeah, replicable skills. It's like, the more you say it, the more it rolls off. Yeah, it's just basically, even... you know, my next record that came like right after Cobra <laughs> Island. And um, mm. yeah, again, like, you know, I'll do these albums that are more like concept and then some that are just more, you know, your classic mix tape style of rap album. So you giving you a good variety there's you know a lot of a lot of the fam came through on there and like the great thing about that and like what i'm loving like even just as we're talking about these you know just think of every album it's like yo i worked i've been working with the same people from you know beat mason's been there fresh kills has been there you know uncle yeah. fest more or less you know all the backburner guys timmy oh, like friend, jesse man. like everybody's just been we've all been working together for this long. So it's fun thinking. I'm like, who's on that one? It's like, Oh yeah. Socks like ghetto socks. And I mm -hmm. have a jam on there. And um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's like ultra Magnus, who is an MC. I met here. Who's actually from New Brunswick. Um, yeah. I met him because I'm in Toronto movie. right now. And he, uh, yeah. Ultra Magnus is dope. Like go look up DJ slam and ultra Magnus. Like they got yeah. three albums on hand solo and uh, he, yeah. Just an incredible MC. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Man. You, you have some really dope collabs. Uh, can we talk about uh, Damage Control with Esoteric? Yeah. How did that happen? Yo. Uh, well, Esso. Uh, I met Esso when he did a show in Toronto a million years ago. He did a show here with Pharaoh Monch. Wow. And Esso, I, spoke, I just spoke to him afterwards and you know, just like giving him props and whatever. And then, mm. uh, then I like wound up messaging him once or twice over the years. And then when I, we did a video for rhyme o'clock mm -hmm. and he was really, like, he shared it and he was sharing this video for rhyme o'clock off third burglar. Yeah. And then he was like sharing this video I did for drawings with words, which is all comic book stuff. And I know like SO is like a comic book head and he was just like, you know, he messaged me and was like, yo, this is dope. Like, I like what you're doing. And he like knew, like we sampled cool Keith and master ACE, like mm -hmm. for the scratches. Um, and he was like, yo, that's a great sample. Like he was just like, really like, he knew what we were doing. Like he got it. And, um, and I just basically said, yo, I can't believe you're messaging me. This is dope. Like I'm obviously mm -hmm. a fan of, of SO and seven L esoteric and Zarface. And I was like, yo, would you ever get down on a track? And uh, he was actually, so I reached out to him to be on Welcome to Cobra Island. Because mm. I knew he had had like some Cobra references. I was like, yo, that'd be dope. And he said no, because he had just done a G.I. Joe track with Apathy. Oh, that actually hadn't even come out that I didn't even know about. But he had just, so like, who knows, man, you know, same mindset. But he had done a song with Apathy about it. Um, and which which is different than any of the ones i did but it was like still like anyways he said he was like you can't do welcome to cobra island he's like but reach out any other time so you know welcome to cobra island was done and then like i got busy doing other stuff and then yeah. i had a concept for this song damage control and i messaged him and sent him the beat and he was down and then we it was just like the best you know he was such a great person to collaborate with and you know i showed him what i was writing and then he built off that and then we bounced ideas around and you know he was like okay so you're mentioning this i'll mention this and then we can play back and forth here and yeah you went um, back and forth yeah man so so yeah dude much love to so uh mm -hmm. and again i think he's a slept on mc i mean obviously zara face is like blowing up uh and it's great to see them getting uh all this attention 
Uh, but even like, like before Zarface, it was like, even then I was like, Esso is like just on another level writing wise, like his rhymes, like that's the kind of stuff I like, you know, a lot of metaphors, a lot of like, you know, the wordplay, the concept, he's got a great concept album, uh, yeah. Saving Seamus Ryan, which is a, oh wow, album. yeah, check that album. It's a really, really, it's actually is one of my favorite songs that he's ever done on it, um, called Back to the Lab. And it's about okay. his dog. Wow. Okay. Go peep that. That's a hidden esoteric gem. Write that down. Back to the lab. That. Yo, that so many gems dope. tonight. Yo. So many gems. Yeah. Much, much love to esoteric. Man, it's it's dope as hell. Um, you were in a pizza pop commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, man. That actually helped me pay for uh, some of burglaritis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah man. so and you beat out drake for the part let's go yo so this was back when drake was on degrassi junior or degrassi high degrassi junior high whatever it was called and uh there was this casting call and i got asked to go audition for this thing mm -hmm. and they were looking for rappers and it was like paid a lot of money and it was like yo dope okay i'll go out i'll, I'll yeah. audition and they just wanted you to come in and like rap your own lyrics so mm -hmm. i went and i was sitting in the waiting room next to drake and there's a bunch of other mcs there danio canadian legend danio yes. was there and uh yeah i went in i did the audition <laughs> what'd you rap i probably rapped something from wb actually Love it. Because Love that it. would have been that era. I probably just kicked like a 16 from that track. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah. I'm trying to, I remember I was probably like, yeah, it sucks like getting a, a vacuum for your birthday. You know how I feel about rap without wordplay. It sucks like getting a vacuum for your birthday. Mm -hmm. Wow. Dug in the vault for that one. Um, like, so that verse, I think mm -hmm. that, uh, and like, I remember, you know, the people, the, they, I was like, that audition went really well. Anyways, I wound up getting the part. Danny O got the part. Drake did not get the part. So now I never well, saw Drake audition. Maybe he was there auditioning for something else, but I'm pretty sure we were all there to rap for pizza pops. <laughs> and that, that ad played for a while. Um, mm. And, uh, and the way those things work, when you get a commercial on national TV, they have to pay you, every time they renew a cycle so a cycle okay. is like three months so yep. you get paid like you get paid for your work then you get paid for three months that it's going to mm -hmm. air and then if they renew it they have to pay you right so i would just get checks every time it got renewed and be like this surprise check and it was good money yeah and it, it was dope and here i am just like a underground rapper working at a comic book store and then you get a check from pizza pops it's like yo we're not eating pizza pops tonight <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. um were you more recognizable after that or like did they kind of keep you uh, your anonymity a little bit yeah i mean they didn't really like say yo this is word burglar and right i think people who knew me knew it and yeah. then yeah, I don't think it really uh, contributed to anything. Like, I'm not really even wrapping in the ad. Like, they filmed a whole bunch of stuff. I'd love to see the footage on the floor. I'd love to see the audition footage. If they've got audition footage of Drake, that would be, I'm sure that exists somewhere. That would be um, historic for sure. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Fuck yeah. I, I don't know. It was just like, it was cool. It was fun. And it was on a lot and people would tell me i would get people would call me and be like yo i just saw your ad it's fun. <laughs> but great. yeah i didn't i didn't actually rap in the ad i think i wound up the clip is of me saying like this is whack because we're in this guy in this stomach we're in like a kid's stomach and okay, the brain yeah, yeah, yeah. comes in the brain's got like a baseball bat and he's like interrupts our concert um because daniel and i are like rapping mm. uh and DJ DJ Tricks is DJing, and then we, we just have to stop, and the stomach comes in and kicks us out of the brain. So <laughs> if anybody remembers that ad, yeah, and they I, gave me I fake think tattoos. I do remember something about stomach in there, yeah, yeah, yeah that's man. fire. I had fake tattoos all down my arms. It's hilarious. Love it, love it. 
Wow, um, this is deep. Oh man, we got to. You're word burglar. We have to know. Yo, does the D and MDB stand for deep? Because yeah, like this is under this is under the underground. You know, I love it. I love it. So underground, the worms live above us. Wait, what? That's that. that. You got some. You got some lines, and and we're gonna get into some of your dope lines because I wrote a few of them down. Uh, On layman's terms, you said everyone needs me, like healthcare. I know I'm dope like weed that's self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like uh, sounds like one of mine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it definitely does, man. It definitely does. Um, on Rhyme O'Clock, you said, is that the word burglar? You know it, fam. And I'm down with Sharon like Lois and Bram. <laughs> <laughs> I did. And we got Bram in the video for that. Whoa. If you look closely, there's a gentleman walking by uh when i i think it's when i say that rhyme and he's got a guitar case and he just kind of stops and looks over and that's a cameo from bram and shout out jason levangie the director who cold called bram's agent he found out who his agent was like yo does bram want to come do a walk-on in this video we don't have any money but like it'd be crazy and bram was like hell yeah i'll do it he just came down and walked onto the set it was incredible so it's a fun little thing now. It's good. I got. I haven't watched that video in a while. It's, I'll have to go back. It's, it's You're giving fun. me so many exclusive gems right here. Like, no, I have, dude. I, I, my appreciation for you is so great right now. Um, my appreciation man. for you is gargantuan. <laughs> man, I appreciate you appreciating me. Let's, uh, let's just appreciate. Let's just call this the appreciation natives. Uh, the appreciation. The appreciation natives. Oh my God! Appreciation Nation. I don't know. know. Appreciate Appreciation. The Appreciation. <laughs> there Let's you go. go. I feel like that's Canada. <laughs> Somebody's probably got it. Yeah. Yeah, that's Canada. Um, man, I love the song "Point of Departure." It's it's definitely a point of departure for you, like in like subject matter, because you don't really have like a ton of songs where you tap into the emotional like uh, space. But like this one really hits. Uh, you said, trust me, you're going to find the right person. Just take it in stride because a big part of life's hurting. Whew, bro, insane. Yeah, man, that song took me. That was probably the longest it's taken me to write any song. Yeah. And I did that song and I remember I could only do one verse and I let it hang. And then I had to come back and write the second verse because it was really important to me. The song is about a breakup and it's based on my personal experience. It was based on a few things. Like I had been going through a pretty breakup that was like affecting me, you know, when you're young, like your first big major breakup, it's like that affects you. Uh, And then at the same time, like two other people I knew were going through breakups. And I don't know if you've ever been through a breakup, but like there's a weird thing where it's like when you're in couples and you're like doing your thing, but then when you're all of a sudden you're broken up, it's like you kind of have to like go back and like figure out a lot and figure out maybe who you are and what, you know, what you are looking for in a partner. And, And it's a great time to, you know, just figure stuff out for yourself and it's a know, lot of learning that happens when you lose someone that's important to you um i feel like uh love can almost uh be an addiction like uh i've been addicted to people and then like when i lost them it was a little more uh hurtful to my life like you know what am i gonna do when they're not around now you know like um so like i feel you on that yeah but then you know you find who you are and you've, you know, and it's okay to be by yourself. And that's like figuring out, like, it's good to be alone and to do this stuff. And yeah. I remember like my life, actually, my world just opened up. Like I would, I saw one person going through a bad breakup and it just became very destructive and bad. And like, yeah, and we've seen that happen. And then for me, it was like, yeah, it hurt, but it was also a whole bunch of things opened up that I never thought. I met new people. I tried new things. I went out and, Mm. you know, did more. I was like, 
I just, and I, again, when you're young too, you know, sometimes like, you know, you, you're too young to like, you can't, and it's not the other person's fault when you're breaking up with somebody, it's just like, it's just not a, a good time. Right. You're just not the right thing. You know, I'm happily married now. I found the love of my life. It's incredible. You know, yes. years later I met her and, um, you know, I never would have met her if I was still with the person I broke up with. <laughs> but anyways, that song is like very important to me. And I, you know, I haven't listened to it in a long time, but I, I still like when you quoted those lyrics, it's like, yeah, that's that time. Like I remember the second verse was really important to me and I rewrote it so many times because trying to capture that, like the feeling of, you know, loneliness and confusion. And you're like, what, what did I do wrong? What did they like? What, what's, right. what is life? What's the point? Like what is going on? But then finding that, you know, the, the cliche, but finding the silver lining, finding um, yeah. something there and, uh, and looking at from it. basically, yeah, you know, and, and you know, taking a negative, flipping it to a positive and uh, and looking, you know, find it really looking on the bright side, which is, uh, you know, what I like to do. And um, mm -hmm. I'm glad you like that song and I'm really proud of it. And uh, yeah, I don't know if the person who it's about ever heard it. Um, I don't we didn't really have any contact with them, but uh mm -hmm. But yeah, and shout out Bear Beats who made that beat. And uh, I mean, the beat alone will make you cry, man. For real though, for real. Yeah. But yeah, no, yeah. Point of Departure, that's a, that's a song I'm definitely proud of. So thank you. Hell yeah. Quote, I keep on rocking the floor to get you open like Black Moon unlocking the door. <laughs> Yo, man, you're rapping it better than me. <laughs> no fucking way. No fucking way. That's a man. that's a deep cut, man, for people who would get that. So yeah, I appreciate it. Oh that. man. Um boom baparang. I love it. Yeah, boom man. Bap yeah, I was like really, yeah, I was I was high, you know, when you write lyrics and you're like, yo, I love these rhymes. Like I remember writing boom baparang and I was like, yo, I love these rhymes. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I love all you know, I'm you I'm, love rhymes. I you know what to say, I love rhymes. I love rhymes. So, you know, yeah, no, yeah. for sure. And you love Halifax. Um, Big, I, got said, a lot of uh, I just prefer to see ships that tall and getting busier than Christmases at Micmac Mall. Whew. That's real. That is <laughs> fucking real. Well, I grew up right downtown. So and that reference was about condos going up in like my neighborhood, which like I grew up with like you know like church and morris and like right around barrington and harvey yeah. street and that whole area which has changed a lot and like i was talking earlier there was a ywca on barrington and that, there's yeah. actually a reference in that song but that's i think that's what that is referring to yeah like, you know it's it became the w suites but it used to be the ywca and yeah. you know before a lot of those things went up you could see like right down to the harbor a little clearer mm -hmm. and i would go see the look at the tall ships you know i could walk tall down ships, the, yeah. i walk to the water in like a few minutes is you know you know you know amherst you can just kind of it's great when you can walk to places and, uh, <laughs> yeah um that that's a cool thing i'm in moncton now it's a little different walking to places but um you know it, it's still good it's still good um, it's beautiful yeah i was moncton in moncton you were in 19 i think yeah, 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 yeah. I was there at the comic book uh, convention show that you did. Yes, yes. Were you at the bar too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that was a good night, man. And that it's funny, eh? When you think before COVID, like we were in that yeah. basement and it was like so small and so small and packed. It was packed. That was a crazy, that was a great night. And shout out Don Mann who put that mm -hmm. together. I felt safe in that venue and like, Moncton's a great place, but there's a lot of venues that I don't exactly feel safe in. And um, that that group of people that you had brought together was just a good bunch of people. And I felt safe. I Yo, mean, thank you. I'm glad, man. Well, that's you should always you know, that's so important that everybody coming out to shows does feel safe. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, look, the bands that I like to tour with and play shows with and other acts like we all kind of keep similar mindsets. So when people you know, I think positive energy just keeps building more positive energy. Right. And right. so, yeah, let's, let's put more of it out there. And I mean, your, your songs don't attract um, an energy of anything other than happiness and chill. 
thank you, man. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's the best I could hope for. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, oh man, like I, I get mad at, at clubs that like turn down hip hop shows on its face and like, they, they look at it like, okay, you're going to bring the wrong crowd to my establishment. But then a person like you comes along and completely flips the script on that whole narrative. Well, thank you. And like, I mean, that was a big issue. It's always an issue, but yeah. you know, when I was starting out finding hip places to play, nobody would put on hip hop shows in Halifax. Right. And even in Toronto, there's a lot of places that wouldn't. And like, so basically I started figuring out how to just put on my own shows because mm. no one would do it. So I was just, me and my friends would just book our own venues and we'd set it up and we'd be like, yo, what's the guarantee that we need to like, make the bar happy and then bar be like we have the bar sells this much money you know you guys can keep the money from the door and whatever and sure enough people came out people partied and um and the bars kept asking us to come back so that was a good thing and mm -hmm. um you know every now and then someone will ruin that for you and yes. those are the people who you don't want to do shows with and you don't want to continue working with so uh because they ruin things for everybody but, uh, Absolutely, yeah. man. Um, you know, hip hop's a culture of uh, of people, and you know, it was based on uh, respect and having fun. And um, you know, the you know, and it's kind of diverted from that now. But um, uh, you you bring that, so it's appreciated. Well, um, yeah, thanks. I mean, that goes back to my love of hip hop and like the yeah. early days and like that positivity. And hip hop's given me so much. It's given me, you know it's given me all the fun, but it's given me education. It's given me inspiration, motivation. Mm. I mean, it's given all of us this like, you know, this energy, like rap and hip hop has just given me more than I could ever give back. So I'm always trying to like, just project like that real, you know, that energy and that positivity and going back and, yeah, and it's about being, yeah, true to yourself. And then also like true to like what this is and going back to all this stuff, mm. talking about the Bronx and talking about like, yeah, the early days and bringing people together and party yeah. rocking and having good times and, uh, and getting messages yeah. across and like, you know, being political when you, when you need to be in and, and mm -hmm. giving a voice to people who need that voice. Right. So. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about some of your friends. Cause you have some extremely talented friends. Oh yeah. Uh, I, you, you hang out with people who are way talented, more talented than you. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you can, you can do okay. So that's, that's you make my, magic yeah. happen. <laughs> I just surround myself with people who are way more talented than me, man. And that's just like, you know, how straight. did you, uh, how did you meet beat Mason? Wow. So Mason, this is actually kind of a funny, crazy story. I was in a, like underground theater company i guess this is the best way to describe it called purple octagon theater mm -hmm. and it was a bunch of artists it was this collective of people musicians actors writers directors um and it was just basically like this kind of like i hesitate to say like counterculture but it was this like underground artist collective uh, yep. in halifax uh, formed by some, my friends, my friend Andre Davy and uh, Dave Roxborough and a whole squad of people, and Greg Richardson. And it was called the Octagon, Purple Octagon, because there were eight. There were eight different artists that sort of founded this thing. And okay. I was one of those eight people. And we would put on these underground theater shows uh, because we just wanted to perform and have music and comedy and theater in Halifax because the kind of theater that we wanted to see, there was no venues for it. And again, this goes back to like the same thing about finding venues to put on shows. Mm. So Purple Octagon for a couple of years there, we were doing shows at fringe festivals and like we would put on theater at bars. So there okay. was this, so Ryan Duffy's, I don't know if you know, Ryan Duffy's was this place on Spring Garden Road. No, I don't. And we, we did Pulp Fiction, the musical. Oh, wow. Oh, no, it was called Pulp Fiction Live. Okay. And so Andre wrote Quentin Tarantino to try and get the rights to do Pulp Fiction as a play. Wow. Quentin never wrote back, but Andre okay. wrote him. And to Andre, shout out my homie Andre Davy. He was like, well, yo, he never wrote me back. So I'm going to take that as like, go ahead and do it. <laughs> no response is a response, right? 
no so exactly exactly so he he pulled together this and if you were a person in Halifax who saw this show it was like nothing you've ever seen before Mm. he did Pulp Fiction live in a bar and there was blood packs there was like all the scenes you can imagine from Pulp Fiction Mm. and and he wound up doing the show in Toronto anyways I was in it in Halifax and I was in Toronto and it was yeah you know it was epic and that's where I met Beat Mason and I think we met maybe previously at a party briefly but Beat Mason came because his brother was Greg who was in Purple Octagon and he was the older brother of Greg right so Greg was a bit older than me Dave's a bit older than Greg um and Greg knew that I rapped and had told Beat Mason about me and he was like, yo, this guy that I'm doing this theater with, he's rapping. And they had, I was doing raps as part of this theater stuff too. And like, I'd be yeah. rapping at the shows and doing the after parties and everything. So it was a lot of great performance experience for me. And Beat Mason was there and we just kind of hit it off. And we liked the same kind of hip hop. And we did a show where Greg used Beat Mason's beats in between scenes. Mm-hmm. So like set changes and stuff. And, uh, and these beats were coming on. I was like, yo, these beats are crazy. And Greg's like, that's my brother. You got to meet him. So, you know, and we, Dave and I beat Mason, we, you know, we just kind of connected and Dave, you know, was like, yo, here's like a couple beats, see what you can do with them. And I think within a week, that's when I recorded that first demo, uh, with like word burglar and, um, no flow and there's a couple other songs on there that i don't know if they ever came out midsummer night's dream was maybe one of them uh anyways they all uh that's how i met b mason through an underground theater community in halley in the 2000s and then we just and we've been working together ever since every question i ask you you give me gems on top of gems. <laughs> Yo. looking great well dude you're just this. asking these amazing questions and uh, man, i appreciate I'm just them. asking the basics you, we have to know these things the secret um, history man this is a secret history tell me about pigeon john oh the pigeon john story is fun i opened for him in toronto uh and he had had he had just i think had one album out at the time but he was down with like a lot of the people from um like the good life cap like if you're familiar with like that whole scene that was coming out of california um like project blowed um all those amazing artists were coming out of this scene there and pigeon john was like down with them and so i kind of you know i as a fan knew knew that music and i knew pigeon john and he had this one song um i woke up in the morning and then what did i see eviction notice on the wall looking for me i don't know if you know that song but that song Mm. is dope and i got booked to open for him and i was like yo wait a second i'm opening for this dude pigeon john this guy's amazing like Mm. i shouldn't be opening for him (laughs) and uh and i met him And I like rap that to him. And I was like, yo, like, I love this song. And he was like, how's this kid from Halifax? How's he even heard this song? Right. And we just hit it off. And then I performed. And then after the show, he was like quoting my rhymes to me. And we just had a great time hanging out, like at the show. And um, then he went left to go to continue the tour. And like, Two or three days later, he called me. I don't know if he called me or emailed me. I think he called me. And because he was the tour manager, I had my number. And he was like, yo, this is John. The, you know, our tour, a couple of dates got canceled. I got to hang out in Toronto. Want to hang out? What's going on? So I was like, hell yeah, Pigeon John. I want to hang out. So we hung out. We went to Kill's studio kills whipped up a beat we laid down a track and uh that was that man i love your segue i love your segue because i was just about to ask you about the legendary fresh kills how did you get up with him man so fresh kills really started backburner with like you know backburner was like 
kills was like the epicenter that back burner like branched out from with thesis and jesse dangerously and dirt roads and the verbals and all these groups like before i got involved you know there's johnny hardcore and jay busy and all these people and um i was working on that album like those tracks i was telling you about with b mason like i had the demo together and i knew jesse dangerously and you know i can't i'd be remiss to not mention jesse Jesse, you know, I knew we would played baseball together and we had been in like Cub Scouts together. We And so we would like bump into each other over the years. And like, as you know, in high school, we were both like, oh, yo, you're doing hip hop, you're doing hip hop. But we went to different schools. We didn't really we weren't at that as connected until like towards maybe the end of high school. And I was yeah. working at the comic shop and Jesse was coming in. Anyways, Jesse was working with these backburner guys. He knew this guy kills who had a studio and he brought me over and kills recorded me and we just hit it off and kills was like yo like here's some beats do you want to rap on some of my beats and i was like hell yeah hell yeah and so then i wrote some rhymes to kills beats and we just stayed friends and you know he was from toronto but he was going to school in halifax mm. so you know when i came to toronto you know kills and i connected again and like we've just been tight ever since you know and yeah again like kills and beat mason have been with me on every project and uh you know it's amazing like i think they're both making like the best beats they've ever made um 100 yeah and kills is just crushing it i mean he's an mpc pad mashing pioneer Oh my God. Yeah. He is a MPC God. Like he just goes crazy. Yeah. And you know, he's just a, he's a great sound engineer and, you know, he records my stuff, mixes my stuff, you know, I'll record with him. I'll record with Timmy, Timbuktu, Swamp Mm -hmm. Thing. Um, So like I say, you know, my secret is just working with people way more talented than me. (laughs) Man. uh, Kills is such a great networker too. Uh, I remember I was at uh, Hip Hop Sundays, which in Moncton was at uh, this place in the O2. Um, and uh, and he, uh, you know, I was off in a corner being shy because I didn't really have a circle at that point. And, you know, he, he was working the room and he didn't he didn't neglect me. He, he came and had a convo with me. He introduced my, me to, you know, him and uh i told him my name and you know we actually chatted for like 15 minutes that day and like every time he came to town i was there after that and you know he still remembered my name you know he still like kept the networking going like he's such a real dude yeah kills is real and uh yeah he's got a new album coming out he has a solo album so definitely check out fresh kills if people Mm. listening have never don't know the the man the legend um, yeah and um, kills kills is really a secret weapon behind a lot of stuff that people probably don't even know about so yeah the kill zone is like a legendary spot too yeah like, yeah so just got it on another level yeah their studio there is now just changing uh he's had to move which i feel bad for him but uh, he's moving into way. a new studio and like i feel bad for me because i'm like 90 percent done my next album i need to finish oh. it <laughs> <laughs> but that'll happen that'll happen so it's all good i hate when that happens yo um, don't you hate it when you get 90 percent done your album yes your studio uh, gets they get evicted like that's yeah man me and my homie 2020 vision finally just got a fresh kills beat it was be the first one i ever rapped over and like you know we're just like puttering on the last two songs of the album that'll finish it up and it's just like man we got to get this out like it's driving me crazy. Yeah, do it. Shout out 2020 Vision. Absolutely. PEI, stand up. Yo, PEI, yes. I Absolutely. haven't played there in a while, but I have played at a few spots on the island. I love it. Charlottetown. Love Charlottetown. That's Charlottetown, I've told people this, it's the only city I've ever been in where chip and dip is like a, like a main course on a menu. And I'm like, yo. <laughs> yes. And you love popping chips. I'm a fan. Yeah, I'm a fan. Yeah, man. Um, you love popping chips. That's that's fire. Okay, yeah. It's um, good. I mean, pop's not that good for you. Chips are probably healthier than pop. So right. uh, I've We're, been cutting back on the pop, but chips, 
I can never quit. I can't quit chips. When you said that on the song, uh, were you disguising pop for beer or no? Yeah, it works both ways. Okay, I'm a cool. fan of lime pop. I was kind of like definitely more the traditional pop and chips, like, mm-hmm. but chips and beer go well together. Basically fizzy <laughs> carbonated <laughs> drinks that aren't necessarily good for you go great with chips. That's what, Absolutely. that's really like the deepest level of that rhyme. <laughs> yes man yo thank you so much for your time man i really appreciate all of this it's my pleasure dude thank um, you for having me and shout out breaking records this is wordburglar.com awesome. for everything yes. word burglar yes we got new vinyl dropping soon new album bergonomic is coming in 2022 stay tuned for that beat mason fresh kills swamp thing buck 65 joe teacher. run it's going to be nuts. You still have the Rap Viper t-shirts? Still got Rap Viper t-shirts. We've got a new design we're going to be launching soon that Dave Howlett did, who's like one of my best friends who does a lot of the artwork for my stuff. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, those, you look, when people support with the merch, I'm, look, I'm just a one, just a one Berg operation over here. So uh, every <laughs> little bit helps. So the, you Hell know, yeah. yeah. Depend on your Bergy to give me more lines than Burberry. You got it. Yes. Yeah, Burberry's got a lot of lines. Yes. And it's like a sale at Burberry because there'd be lines of people trying to buy Burberry. So that's 100%. lines upon lines. Yes, man. Absolutely. Yo, I appreciate all those cuts, man. Deep cuts, man. Thank you. Man, we have to do it. Your word, burglar. You put in <laughs> your history and your time into this scene and this art. And, you know, this is basically me giving you your flowers because I know you get your flowers for your con- comic book contributions. But I feel like, as you say, like, uh, Buck 65 is like very uh under talked about i feel like you're under talked about in in uh the maritime hip-hop scene and you know it's my pleasure to bring all this to light well yo i appreciate that man thank you and look the maritime hip-hop scene i mean that's where it came from that's always my heart so shout out everybody grinded i know it's a hard grind and uh and also i will say like if you're from the maritimes you know look up the history right because there's a lot of crazy stuff that you know stuff way before my time that people forget about you know mm-hmm. and like people like joe run like joe run, there are people before joe run and like you know class of course and everybody and like there's so many amazing artists if you just start digging you're gonna find so much gold um and you know really as maritimers we gotta just keep building up the scene and keep just like you know, supporting and growing our own and putting it out there. Right. So, yeah, yeah. of course. Um, A great reference for uh, history in that regard is uh, the thesis that uh, Hermit of the Woods did and uh, was later, uh, you know, used by a legendary, legendary DJ um, at, uh, at, you know, uh, Bastard's Barbecue. Of course, um, man. Yeah. Shout out, shout out Bastard. uh, I mean, yeah, dude, like, yeah. Hermit of the Woods. Oh my God. I mean, I can't start. I'll start showing people out. I'll be here. All exactly. Day. No, exactly. But he, he gives an all around, uh, he, uh, history of, of the Halifax scene. And I really found that to be helpful when I'm like re- resourcing stuff. So it's, it's dope. Um, thank you. Thank you many times more again. Um, it was an honor. An Peace absolute- man. Yeah. Yo, shout out the whole crew. You know what it is, man. Peace, love and respect. It's hip-hop, baby, and I'm out.